we are live all right um uh, a very good afternoon to all of you um uh, i am delighted that uh, we are we are able to connect using the technology in times that obviously in our generations every in history we have not witnessed before um the covid-19 has disrupted lives businesses globally and of course india has not been immune in any manner today we have gathered to speak about the impact of covid-19 on the insolvency industry the ibc in particular to understand and appreciate it and also to brainstorm together in terms of what measures and actions and steps that may be required going forward in order to mitigate whatever consequences of the mark uh any effects of uh the lockdown which has happened so far and of course in the near future may continue to happen as well perhaps in a diluted form or in Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I would also like to, in particular, thank Dr. Dr. Vijay Bhagat for having taken out the time. I know she is uh, back in her uh, home state uh, and uh, uh, has made that to join. and also i'm very okay. thankful to all the panelists uh, my okay. coach and as well as the fans who joined in an overwhelming number i believe uh, almost close to 400 people are already logged in right now and uh, I, and i think i compliment uh, the asocham team to have organized the technology to make that happen i would like to announce uh, a few housekeeping rules so that we can keep this one hour or little over one hour conversation as efficient uh, as possible stay as productive as possible and from that perspective the procedure that i would follow for the next 60 minutes would be that i would start by making some opening remarks i would then ask each of my co panelists to for 5 to 7 minutes make their remarks uh and when they make those remarks uh please ensure that they are relevant to what you may be speak individually uh and not be repetitive and also please respect the timeline i would then open it for question and answer we would first take the questions that have already come in uh in advance and we are aware of which is what we will take and post that we would uh, open for further question and answers but the fact is that we do have such a huge number and i understand that we may not be able to take each every question but we will try to take as many as we can um i uh, we all know uh, most of us on the screen here um and the introductions have already been circulated in advance so i'm skipping the introductions uh i would just uh, before i make my opening remarks i would like to ask dr vijay bhagia if she's going to be with us for the next one hour uh, and if yes then would she like to make some comments now or at the end i would like to give her that uh, option in the beginning because i know that she has other she has other commitments she's on duty um even though virtually well, madam would you like to speak now or later no i would like to speak now okay very well madam then please yeah. uh, uh as you know that the topic is uh, for us is uh, the impact of uh, ip uh, the covid 19 uh, on uh, ibc uh, will be will be will be very happy if you can share with us what the current thinking at the ibbi is uh, to the extent that you are able to share with us uh to the extent that is for public consumption i know that there are certain things which you may not be able to share which may be confidential or which may be 
uh, not fully mature at the moment. But to the extent that you are able to share, we'll be, we are actually very eager to hear from you in terms of what is the thinking. And based on that, in fact, uh, we can then also reflect on that in our comments, each of us as speakers. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I thank the organizers. I thank the Asochan, and especially Mr. Anil Goyan and Batraji to invite me for this seminar. It's a lockdown period. It's a calm and quiet period like a moratorium, which requires chintan, manan, manthan, everything, so that we can unlock the lockdown. We want to, through this manthan, we want to have a key how to lock down, how to redesign our business models, how to redesign our working culture for the professionals, and how to redesign our individual professional and personal life both. On this occasion, I greet all the learned panelists, speakers, and the participants of this seminar. Aap sabhi bhai bhai no ka mera namaskar hai aur mein aapko shubkamana deti hoon ki ye is webinar ke madhyam se hum koi ne koi aisa innovative indigenous Indian model business ka, profession ka, work culture ka, corporate governance process ka nikalenge. This webinar, I think out of this webinar we may be, we may be able to articulate, formulate, we will, we, we will articulate our thoughts, draw the formulation to mitigate the effects of COVID-19. I think just I want to share one thing, that India is a developing country, not a developed country. But still it is leading in mitigating the effects of COVID-19 and it is in the forefront. Our country, I think after liberalized economic policy, naturally, Globalized economic policy, we had given effect to into our uh, statutes also in the municipal jurisdictions applicable to India. And certainly we were going far ahead. But I think the COVID-19 has shown us the worst effect of globalization. I mean, uh, I think in India there is saying that Pratham Sukh Nirugi Kaya, not Pratham Sukh Kitni Maya, not Pratham Sukh Kitna Gyan Arjan Kiya, but Pratham Sukh is Nirugi Kaya. And that gives us an inspiration to take a lead in the health sector of the industries. Now, as this theme is on the I mean, got our COVID effects and the insolvency process, prior to that, I would like to say that government has been, uh, government has taken advanced steps before we can visualize the adverse effects of the COVID-19. And in that connection, I think there is an article which I was reading in the morning of Mr. Our Honor, Prime Minister Modi ji, and where he talked of adaptability, efficiency, inclusivity, and opportunity. And I think it was, I mean, this will lead us to indigenous industries, adaptability, that means changing our lifestyle, the business models, which are easily adaptable, which doesn't require glamorous life, which doesn't require any dependency. And I think this adaptability will lead us to work from home culture. And I think IBB has started, I'm working, I'm on duty and working from home at present from my hometown. We don't have to measure the efficiency in terms of spending time in the office. We have to measure the terms, we have to measure the efficiency in terms of completing the task, whether from home or from other mechanisms, not in office, but we have to measure in terms of, not in terms of spending time, where you spend the time, 10 to five or nine to six, no. You have to see that whether the task is completed or not. Inclusivity, business models are developed to give primacy to the care of the poor, should be developed. To give the primacy to the care of the poor, health industry is to be focused at a low cost and larger scale. Industries which uh, pertain to supply of essential goods or manufacture essential goods, I think that needs much more focus, and I, in that case, I think the MSMS has to, MSMS need to play a big role, especially after COVID-19, and we have to help the MSMS that the MSMS do not go into uh, insolvency, and for that purpose, Government of India, the central government, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, probably written an audience, and raise the threshold limit of the default from one lakh to one crore, so that the MSMS are not pushed into insolvencies so that if they are not into insolvency certainly they can carry on their business and there is no there will be no unemployment if there is a, it is more it is one lakh or more than one lakh certainly then they, they can be pushed into insolvency and as and the resolution period is 180 days under ibc so there is no problem and from time to time uh, 
IBBI has streamlined the regulations, has uh, attempted to or made an endeavor to streamline the regulations so as to address the inadequacies, shortcomings, or any challenges which the market is facing. So uh, market facing. So we have streamlined our regulations also. For your information, everybody knows that the lockdown has been declared and the during the lockdown period, the judiciary was not working. The offices were closed. Movements were restricted. In many cases, in many districts, there were a complete prohibition also on the movement. And I am signing the red zone, so naturally I know that complete restriction on the movement also. Planes and trains are closed, except cargo planes and cargo trains are uh, flying. In such a situation, when we are facing this lockdown, certainly this lockdown period should not be included where there are timelines provided under the IBC. And for that purpose, recently, IPB amended CIRP regulations, IBB amended liquidation regulations. So to just clarify that the period of lockdown would not be counted for the purpose of competition of the timelines. In addition to that, IBB has certainly, uh, I mean, just clarified to our professionals to facilitate that you need not worry the timelines because in the past, because of failure to perf uh, failure to perform the task within the timelines, I think certain disciplinary actions have been taken for other contravention also disciplinary actions have been taken. So to clarify that, that there will be no disciplinary action if uh, because of the lockdown and they can carry on their function without any stress, without any worry. This lockdown period is a good period for the professionals also. The community task, which they can do it without depending on others. They can do it through online. Certainly, they can. They should complete it. There is an online filing of the forms also, different different forms to keep the IPB update about the cases which are undergoing insolvencies in the NCIT. So, whatever is left not completed, it is good time for the professionals to complete their task, organize their businesses, and also. I think uh, redesign their office culture or the processes so that without even if the lockdown continues, they can further carry on such processes which doesn't require meeting of the two people for physically if they can carry on through video conferencing. There are certain functions which can they can divide. These require meeting of the person and these require doesn't require meeting of person. They can be through VC or through online or through other mechanisms. So I think the professionals need to link in, look into it. And this is a kind of natural calamity. We may face in future number of such calamity in different forms. So we need to design our work culture, the office processes, maybe uh, uh, like uh, maybe some uh, am amendments may be required and uh, in the procedure laws also like CPC and CRPOC, because the, this is the procedure which governs or which uh, regulates the implementation of the substantive laws also. So that's why I think in future CPC and CRPC would be required to maybe we see uh, arguments through video conferencing that's going on. Supreme Court is, uh, has taken steps in urgent cases, but maybe it may become a regular feature. In addition to that, uh, I would like that RBI and SEBI has also, because RBI and SEBI, these are the two regulators in addition to the, in addition to IBBI that they, their regulations, their working methods, their directions affect the market a lot. And actually, being regulators, they need to address the situation, address the challenges of the situation. And as far as this COVID-19 is concerned, the RBI has uh, brought in a change in the prudential framework for resolution of state assets. These are norms were notified on 7th June 2019 for early recognition, reporting, and time of resolution of the state assets. Resolution and IBC is different, but it is a non-statutory mechanism of resolution, a informal mechanism of resolution. And I think uh, by this resolution, uh, by this uh, framework, they have uh, uh, superseded all other non-statutory mechanisms. But RBI, in order to take care of the uh, resolution of the state assets, they have come forward and issued prudential framework for resolution of state assets. Accordingly, there is an early identification and classifying of the assets, a special mention accounts also, SMA, and there is a time period for 1 to 30 days and 61 to 90 days. And these, uh, this uh, information is to be 
uh, inform to the central repository of information by the large, uh, especially in case of large accounts, on the, all the borrowers having exposure to 50 million and above on a monthly basis and a weekly basis. So you'll find that, and there is duration period of 180 days. And in case of default, the lenders is required to review the borrower's account within 30 days. And after 30 days, on the expired 30 days, then there's a 180 days period of resolution also. And the, for the purpose of implementation, the lenders are required to enter into a intercreditor agreement also, which is to be approved by 78% of the value of the total outstanding debt on uh, creditors and the 60% of the total of the lenders present there. So you will find that the ICE, this intercreditor agreement needs to provide rights and duties of the majority of lenders and payment to the dissenting creditors. RB, the, the, the resolution plan according to the say intercreditor agreement shall be implemented within 180 days after the expiry of the review period. There are various conditions laid down in the prudential framework for implementation. For example, independent credit evaluation of the residential debt. Provides in case of RP is not implemented within 180 days, then the additional provision of 20% or 15% of the total outstanding. As per these prudential norms, uh, the default is the indicator of the financial difficulty. And there is also provision for delisting of the securities, borrowers, credit facility are in the uh, non performing states. And all those, there are various conditions detailed in this uh, prudential framework. But as per uh, recent amendment on 17th April 2020, after the government's statement in public, in the press release, I mean, the statement of the governor on 17th April 2020, RBI has reviewed the prudential framework and revised the framework to provide that accounts under review period on 1st March 2020, the period from 1st March 2020 to 31st May 2020 to be excluded from the calculation of 30 days. That means the way the IBBA has extended or excluded the period of lockdown from the timeline. Similarly, RBI has also provided for exclusion of this period from the calculation of 30 days from timeline review and review period to be resumed after 1st June 2020 and upon expiry of which lenders to have 180 days. So there is no deviation in the timelines. Only the time is extended or the time is excluded. That means after 1st June 2020, 180 days will be counted. And when the review period is over, the resolution period starts when it gets extended by another 90 days. So this is reflected in the disclosure, in the notes on accounts, while preparing financial statement for the half year ending in September 2020 and for the financial year 2021. So this, a major step has been taken by the RBI as far as the resolution is concerned. Because the resolution under IPBI or non-statutory resolution under uh, this prudential framework norm. So, I mean, I think both ways, maybe statutory under uh, the regulations made by the IBBI or non-statutory by the RBI, both ways, I think the it will help the industry so that there is no adverse effect of the lockdown as far as their debt uh, settlement or the debt payment or repayment schedule of the debt is concerned. Now there is a moratorium under this framework also. Moratorium term loans, commercial banks, cooperative banks, financial institutions, and BFCs, having finance uh, or uh, finance companies, microfinance institutions, they are and being more, permitted to allow moratorium. Can I request that uh, maybe this issue we can discuss when we take up questions as a panel? Uh, I just thought okay. I'd okay. around uh, uh, on okay. the, the rest of the And then the other, can... uh, yeah, yeah. The other uh, important measure taken by the uh, RBI is that banks to, uh, are permitted to declare dividends because of COVID-19. All banks shall not make any further dividend payout from the profit pertaining to financial year ending on 31st uh, on on March 31st, 2020, until further instructions. So just to uh, save or retain the profits and to help this uh, economy. This declaration has been made by the RBI that the banks will not declare the dividend also. In addition to that, in addition to uh, this, there is a declaration by the uh, Ministry of Finance also regarding the uh, income tax, regarding GST, and various due dates have been extended and uh, looking at the practical difficulties of the COVID-19 and late fee or the penalty for lockdown period for any compliance under GST. It has been waived. 
Now, interest on delayed payment has been reduced to 9% against 12% or 18%. And we'll find that the Ministry of Finance has made uh, efforts to help the industries, uh, enterprises, and debit card holders are to withdraw the cash for free from any other bank's ATM for three months, where a waiver of minimum balance has been also been declared by the minister, uh, honorable minister. Then the reduced bank charge for digital trade transaction has also been declared. So you'll find that there are various exemptions, relaxations given by the Ministry of Finance to help the economy, to help the uh, corporate debtors, to help the industry as a whole. Now there are certain efforts by the MCA also. Already I have said that the MCA through ordinance promulgation has uh, extended the threshold limit of the default. But there are certain other ancillary uh, efforts made by MCA through which uh, they have uh, tried to make an endeavor to uh, mitigate the effects of COVID-19. There is a relaxation in compliances and payment of additional filing fees because we know that MC21 is there and everybody has to file compliances. So there is no additional fee during this moratorium period and um, mandatory requirement of holding various meetings under the companies that has been waived. Uh, deferment of the applicability of the company's auditor's report by one year it has been deferred and the creation of the deposit repayment reserve deferred. So you'll find that the MCA, Ministry of Finance, RBI, all have, even the SEBI, yeah, has given certain exemptions and relaxation in the compliances also. Then uh, uh, as far as the working capital is concerned, the borrowers are also facing working capital and I think there is a relaxation exemption uh, regarding the interest also, payment of interest and accounts provided. Uh, I mean, the lending institutions must certify themselves that this is necessary on account of the economic fallout and thereafter they will be given uh, exemptions by the lender uh, by the lenders even the classification and special uh, mention account uh, as uh, uh, non-performing yeah. assets tendered accounts i think that uh, there also the rbi has issued circulars and uh, directions sebi has also announced various relaxation in compliance and reporting requirements of different market players to more registers from the market so in nutshell i should say that all those professionals, processes, procedures, enterprises, industries, corporate debtors who are affected by this COVID-19. I think every individual is affected, all the corporates are affected, and all other bodies and associations which do not fall under the category of corporate, they are also being affected. This COVID-19 has globally affected everybody, and in the globalized economy, I think, uh, every country is mutually affected because there is a global globalization of the economy, of the businesses. Some, some, something is manufactured in China, it is exported, uh, it is in, uh, India is importing or India is exporting to China. So you'll find that globally, everybody, everywhere, maybe a labor class, maybe a, of, I mean, a bureaucratic officer or maybe a high class businessman is affected by COVID-19. Now, this I have narrated what efforts they have taken. But let us see what efforts we can think of after declaration of these exemptions, relaxations by different ministries, by different regulators. What we can do it. As far as the insolvency and bankruptcy process is concerned, the most affected, uh, corporates are no doubt affected, but I think the number of the corp number of the individuals as a common man is more than the number of corporates, no doubt. And certainly they are affected at large. It is a kind of public interest. And looking at the public interest, we have again two processes which are not yet in force. One is the individual insolvency. Personal guarantor part. Personal guarantor part is no doubt being enforced, but it's still the fresh start on the indigenous insolvency part has not taken off. It has not started yet. Uh, work is on, is at under finalization, but it's still not notified, hence cannot be enforced. 
there are other methods for example prepack in other countries prepack in other countries which doesn't require which may require strategy provision if it is the, if a government can do it if there is no prepack then doing prepack is not unlawful or unconstitutional this is an inform informal method there is a process of mediation also which we can adopt in settling the claims instead of filing application before nclt waiting for the orders delaying the process when professionals are employed they should adopt mediation process to settle the claims to settle certain issues which can be settled concluded with the help of a mediator and insolvency profession can also play the role of can also play the role of mediator also i think all the professionals have to learn the technique of mediation uh, i taught the technique of mediation and be mediator so that this process can be completed within 100 days only why 180 days can completed within 100 days also if we adopt pre pack it can be completed i think within 80 days also if they, all the processes are completed or part of it are completed through pre pack method and then later on after arriving at a conclusion of the settlement of the plan that that can be put up for them so vijay vargya may request it please wind up this we other we have only 30 minutes left and other speakers also have to speak yeah so mediation pre pack or fresh start individual insolvency these are the processes which need to uh, engage technology online processes so that without even if there is a lockdown we can start with and we can help the society the individuals and the corporates to mitigate the effects of covid 19 thank you thank you very much Thank you so much, Dr. Vijay Vargya. I, um, what I will do is, uh, I will take only about five to seven minutes. Uh, I will do some actually rapid fire uh, thought sharing with, with you. Uh, without expanding on each, uh, we can all do that on the sides at some point in time. Uh, we all understand that this is a time where we can perhaps uh, we need to appreciate that this is not a time, in my opinion, to think of continuity as to how can we continue from where we left. This is actually an opportunity to think absolutely, absolutely afresh out of the box and use disruption as an opportunity, which is what uh, the Prime Minister also wrote uh, in the article Dr. Varghia referred to, which Varghia referred to. But for me, I, I think there are, if we come to the specifics, uh, some of the macro and the micro level points, uh, for me, what is it that the various stakeholders should be doing? There are two things which I suggest that the IPs should focus on as soon as things open up and allow them to work. One is that the entire focus, the entire focus should be to achieve stabilization of the business, to achieve uh, stabilization to the at least levels of status quo NTA, NTA where they can actually try and achieve at least the cash flow, the workflow, uh, to the extent it was, or close to what it was when the lockdown happened. This is absolutely imperative in order to stabilize the valuations of the business as well, which is directly linked to the fact whether you'll be able to find investors or resolution applicants at all in terms of the pending cases. Um, the second thing which the, uh, the IPs also need to do is, uh, is the cost management. Uh, this is going to be a very difficult time and we all will need to be very, very sensitive in terms of how costs are management, including professional fees, managing businesses uh, and all the money that is spent. Uh, there has to be a very high level uh, scrutiny and accountability in, in the given circumstances. Every penny, penny should be spent well and we will all have to as professionals make adjustments in order to ensure that there's no hard burnings that a particular stakeholder or a, a set of stakeholders are still continuing to benefit in the same way professionally um, i i feel that the cocs will probably have to show maximum pragmatism uh, because invariably we will see requests coming in from applicants potential resolution applicants those who have already submitted plans they will want to revisit their plans those whose plans have been approved by the cocs are pending before the nclt or are uh, binding to that effect on the resolution applicants want to revisit their terms one more time or even want withdrawals in certain cases uh, 
uh, there are ca- the resolution plans that have been approved under in- implementation they would want to come back and renegotiate and coc will have to take a very pragmatic view on all of these i don't think we should be hyper technical about it this is uh, as dr vijay varga was saying has affected every single individual entity in whatever shape and form and we will have to take a completely objective view on any such request come in but of course ensure that not be this is not abused by anybody in order to take advantage uh, this has to be a bona fide use uh, to revisit it at all as far as the ibbi is concerned i i of course we'll have to do much more because ibc had just about taken off and um, a uh, lockdown has taken the winds off from under the uh, uh, air from off winds uh, the wind off from the wings of the ibc and we will have to really really start almost afresh when it comes to um, ibc and and this is not going to be an easy task uh, which is where i think ibb will have to put their head together and really see what needs to be done but in the meantime as dr bagya said that these sort of proceedings have to be put in a pause and they have to take a much more lenient view they have to take much more uh soft soft uh, glove approach to compliances they have to ease the filing requirements the, the all the burden that the ips have on doing various compliances that have to be really really eased uh, down uh, as far as the ministry is concerned uh, of course other than the ordinance that is in the pipeline i think the ministry really needs to in my opinion uh, uh, he's is the pressure of the ibc as a main tool to up the ease of india ease of business ranking for india because i think there was an overwhelming pressure on ibc to serve as the main ladder to climb india up on the ranking of ease of business ease of business uh, you know doing business for the world bank i i think uh, it is important that the ibc is allowed to grow organic organically it is allowed to take its own pace and, uh, no issues stated to, to sort of use it for the benefit of uh, creating it uh, compensating it for the other uh, aspects in the uh, in the economy, which pull the ranking down um, the supreme court will certainly have to revisit the jurisprudence uh ncrs will find at times uh, constrained by the supreme court judgments of showing that uh, having held that this is hardcore brutal economic commercial law uh, we will have to look at it from the prism of humanitarian and social issues and if we will not do that the high courts will start stepping in as article 19 at 21 uh, violation because the fact is that covid 19 uh, would have impacted the uh, lives life and liberty of people and if nclts and uh, all of us not look at that aspect of the ibc and look at it as purely as a commercial point of view at this point of time we will face the risk of high courts exercising their constitutional jurisdiction and granting leave to those to those that we shall have eyes on um, I, i also feel that one of the other things of course the rbi will need to do is to revisit his uh, june 19 2019 circular because the reality of the life is that the center of gravity will shift to out of court restructuring for the next one year uh, in the face of section 29a in the face of the thinning of stream of investments uh, in the distress as a space in the likelihood of we facing less resolution applicants coming forward the promoters are likely to be the most attractive bet for the banks and therefore we need to create more to the environment and abilities uh, in order for an effective opportunity for restructuring and insolvency uh, in the out of uh, nclt space till such time we are able to stabilize the ibc again these are some of the that i want to share at this moment in time i'd like to move to anil uh, for your 5 to 7 minutes and then uh, we will go to sahil 
and, and of course, if the comments that I've already made, if you could just, Anil, avoid any of those being repeated, unless you want to amplify any particular point or supplement it, uh, so that you can make best use of your time. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. And my greetings to uh, Dr. Mukulita Vijay Vargia and uh, all my co-panelists, and also my greetings to all the participants who are presently uh, with us. As uh, Sumit, you said, uh, I would uh, like to restrict myself uh, on uh, on one of the key topics that we uh, uh, said to the participant that we would be attending to. So one of the key topic is that the impact of uh, uh, IBC after COVID-19. Uh, so first, let me say that this uh, the impact of COVID-19 is not going to be uh, over uh, as expected by many. Uh, it might be over in phases and there will be some businesses which would be actually adversely impacted for even a year or even more than that. In some of the internationally international scenes, we have already seen that the uh, opening of bars and restaurants has already been uh, said that it would not open till the uh, Christmas this time. So there are many businesses which actually would continue to have adverse impacts. Uh, as far as the insolvency profession, insolvency law is concerned, uh, I think uh, uh, Honorable Finance Minister has already said that in case the lockdown uh, uh, goes beyond uh, 30th of April, then uh, she might have to suspend the uh, uh, invocation of Section 7, 8, 7, 9, and uh, uh, 10. So we are still uh, to see whether this uh, suspension would be uh, applicable to those defaults which are uh, for the purpose of lockdown, or it would be applicable even to the defaults or NPAs which were uh, existing in the banks even for the last two years or three years, even more than that. That we have to see when this suspension will uh, uh, come. Uh, the impact of impact on the insolvency profession as far as this uh, increasing the threshold limit of 1 lakh to 1 crore, it is going to be uh, immense impact on the profession. Like to my understanding, to my estimate, maybe more than 50% of the applications which are already filed uh, to various benches of NCLT by various operational creditors might even be dismissed when they come for the next hearing. Uh, I understand that this is applicable uh, on the day when the order is passed. Since section four is amended, so when the order would be passed, it would be considered as uh, not uh, compliant, so it would be dismissed. Uh, this time, uh, everyone would use for consolidation, even the NCLT, even the IPAs, even all the IPs and IPEs, they would use for consolidation, they would use for learning, and they would also use for making processes and systems. In uh, uh, see this, this profession has seen uh, a growth which is unprecedented growth so this will be an appropriate time for all of us to uh, consolidate the all the existing cases wherever uh, uh, the cirp has already started or the liquidation has al already started will continue but the biggest difficulty that we will see the resolution applicants would actually be evading they would not be available and if they would be available they would be asking for revaluation of the assets and they would also like to take the example of this uh, adverse economic situation consequent to the COVID-19. In the case of liquidation also, they would uh, every bidder would like to wait uh, for the reduction in the prices. So that is a very, very big uh, uh, impact on the insolvency practice and the stakeholders or the committee of creditors may not agree in the, uh, in, in the recent uh, future. They would take some time in understanding the market and then only they would allow the valuations to be uh, further reduced. Though my uh, scenario here is like, but still there are possibilities that the home buyers might even continue because the home buyers are uh, covered under uh, section seven. They can file applications jointly and they can definitely achieve uh, the class of creditors status as per the amendment in section seven or even otherwise they can file jointly. The workmen and employees also would not be adversely impacted because they would be filing this application jointly because they can jointly file an application to reach that one crore milestone uh, threshold limit uh, because it is applicable to them. They can file a joint applications. However, the uh, suppliers of goods and uh, services, they would not be able to file joint applications because the, every story is different. Every notice is different. Every dispute is different. So they are not allowed to file uh, joint applications. Whereas the workman employees and the financial creditors are allowed to file joint applications, uh, 
as far as the class of creditors is concerned, they would be getting the advantage of amendment in section seven, where they actually can go ahead with 10% or even uh, 100 uh, cases. So understanding this uh, impact on the insolvency, uh, we also see uh, some good part of it, like the, uh, the overburden of NCLT would be relaxed uh, they would be able to focus more on uh, uh, various applications which are pending under section 43, 45, 66. There would be some kind of uh, uh, fear in the market that yes, uh, the fraudulent activities during CIRP or even before the CIRP, uh, non-cooperation with the uh, IPs is a very big issue that also can be attended to now because the NCLT would have uh, more uh, focus uh, on uh, larger cases. So that also is very, very important. So uh, the uh, understanding is like as far as this one crore to uh, one lakh to one crore is concerned, uh, while it is being uh, said that it would be beneficial to MSME, so it will be a kind of mixed uh, for MSME. Some of the MSMEs uh, might even think that my debt is uh, less than one crore, so nobody would uh, invoke insolvency for me. But most of the MSME is uh, uh, worried because they would actually uh, miss this remedy uh, which is available to them for uh, invoking uh, the IBC to recover their dues from their customers. So that uh, would be missing to them and they probably would feel bad about it. But this uh, increase in the threshold limit will definitely give a kind of a breather uh, to most of the NCLT benches and members because they have been working very hard and nobody expected that kind of rush. But then more than 50% of the operational creditors application would be dismissed. That would be a very, very uh, big relief. So uh, I would not take more time, but we'll leave some time for the uh, uh, questions Thank also. You so much. And I you can uh, take over. Appreciate very much. Appreciate very much. Can I now go to Sahil, uh, Sahil uh, on the valuation? Uh, please. Sure. Thank you so much, Sumanta. And greetings to Dr. Mukulita Vijay Vargia and my co-panelists, as well as all the attendees who have come in in huge numbers today. So um, I feel that the best way to actually, or the only way to uh, measure and impact is the valuation. So what we have seen is that uh, due to the COVID-19, there is a lot of unforeseenability. So since there is a lot of skepticism and pessimism in the market, which is hovering around us, and uh, uh, you know this is actually leading to the leading to the diminishing in the value. So what I would like to do is I would like to break down my answer of the impact on valuations post COVID on the IBC into three parts. One, I would like to first address the land and the constructed property. So here, if you see even uh, by as per the last IBBI newsletter, about one third of the total admitted cases uh, belong to the real estate, construction, hospitality, and allied sector. So these sectors have, as it is seen, a lot of stress even pre-COVID era. And now post-COVID, and since these sectors are both uh, dependent upon the lot of migrant workers and also highly leveraged. So these sectors will definitely see a huge impact on the valuations and the valuers and all stakeholders will have to, you know, uh, look at these very carefully. Um, next, I would like to go upon the plant and machinery. So what has happened on the plant and machinery side is that, you know, you cannot view plant and machinery in isolation, but it has to be seen as an embedded asset class. So for example, there might be a lot of sectors which, you know, would shoot up in demand primarily now because of the COVID, uh, uh, post-COVID era made with the pharmaceuticals, made with the healthcare, the technology-driven sectors, so on and so forth. So the valuations in these sectors may remain um, uh, as per pre-COVID era or probably even shoot up, but the other sectors will have a definitely uh, great impact in the short term, to say the least. Similarly, if you look at the security and financial assets, you know, there, the value is primarily driven from two, three main asset classes. One is your investment. So you have already seen that the stock market in India and across the globe has plummeted to about 30 to 40 percent. So you can expect the private investments or the investments into the privately held companies to also fall at the similar or even uh, you know lower levels because of, uh, of the impact of COVID. And similarly, we also see that a lot of balance sheets are swelled up primarily because of a lot of receivables sitting on the books of accounts. So these receivables would definitely see a lot of stress and the cash flows would be difficult to come in as far as these unpaid uh, debtors and receivables are concerned. 
so overall i think in a short to medium term this will have a great impact on the downside as regards the valuation is concerned but at the flip side you know india is better poised than the other um, you know emerging markets and as well as the uh, uh, you know the matured markets but we definitely are more positive to see a lot of traction and investments coming into the country in a mid to long term which will definitely see the valuations restore or even shot up in the uh, mid to long term uh, uh, duration well, uh, thank you so much. I like that was short and crisp. Uh, I like it because uh, you just hit the nail right on the head and hit it hard. Uh, I think valuation is going to be really the buzzword as soon as we open. And a lot of questions that are coming in also are essentially around the subject. And I'm sure all of us would have a common teach later on to deal with evaluation because that's going to be one of the most critical issues. Basant, can we go to you now again, please? Uh, you know, as Sahil did and Anil did, let's stick to five to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Suman. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Vijay Vargya and the co-panelists and uh, all the attendees. Uh, I would like to touch upon the two issues, which is uh, the increase of threshold from uh, 1 lakh to 1 crore and uh, the extension of uh, time for completion of CARP under the IBC, uh, extension of the lockdown period. The first, uh, these, are un these are all unprecedented times. so. Uh, whatever little bit legal uh, interpretation and help uh, we can sort of identify in uh, making the insolvency uh, bankruptcy code work, uh, we try and do that in this. And first, I would like to take the issue of uh, raising the threshold from uh, 1 lakh to 1 crore. Uh, in this regard, I would like to start by uh, highlighting the finance minister's speech on 24th March, uh, which uh, she categorically said that the threshold shall be increased so that we can prevent the triggering of defaults against msmes so the intention of the finance minister on 24th march was for uh, triggering the default preventing the triggering of default against msmes but notification when it came out it read, it, it reads that the threshold applies to all corporate debtors not just msmes so uh, that leaves the ambiguity and that leaves another important legal question in this uh, uh, notification is whether it is retrospective or prospective. So, uh, in our view, it is prospective because the notification is uh, not speaking specifically or mentioning about uh, retrospective effect, effect of that increase in the threshold. Uh, we are of the view because of the fact that uh, the section four of the IBC, as well as the rulemaking power under section 239, uh, uh, does not stipulate power of the central government to have the retrospective effect. So as rightly said by Anil, we need to amend the section four to give a retrospective effect. So as of now, as of today, where we stand today, uh, the notification of the Ministry of Finance uh, with respect to increasing the threshold uh, doesn't have a retrospective effect. So in this regard, we have a lot of Supreme Court case laws also, but there are two important case laws which are relevant for the purpose is uh, the Srinivasa Jute Mill uh, Twin Mills case and uh, Kanak Exports case, which quietly settles down the issue of whether the particular notification can have a retrospective effect or a prospective effect. So in this notification, as we rightly uh, uh, read the notification before, it's not speaking about retrospective explicitly. So uh, we can safely infer and uh, come to a conclusion that the notification is of the prospective effect, not the retrospective effect. So then when it comes to the uh, implication of this notification uh, while the notification is likely to help MSMEs who have been hit the hardest by COVID-19 oh, hello yeah yeah please I go ahead was, yeah please go ahead now yeah am I audible now yeah. it'll yes. impact it'll, it, it'll adversely impact the ability of operational creators to initiate CERP so those operational creators which are not able to meet the increased threshold will now have to resort to the previously set up mechanism of debt recovery, such as uh, approaching the civil courts uh, or MSME or surface or DRT, that sort of mechanism we need to go to. At the same time, uh, another repercussion is that, uh, you know, uh, with respect to the employees or workman, uh, that there is a little bit of uh, issue with respect to the employees knocking the doors of the uh, IBC uh, for uh, outstanding crosses rupees one crore. So the government proposal, uh, these are the prop, these are the problem, these are the legal uh, gray areas which may come in uh, uh, 
in in way between the uh, the implementation and the uh, procedural aspect a suggested means of uh, mitigating all ill effects of the increased limit is to find some middle ground that would balance the interest of both corporate person as well as creditors see the better thing is to adopt the intelligible uh, differentia intelligible differentia is the need of the r in the classification of a financial and operational creditors could be considered by way of another amendment to the effect uh, uh, the next topic i quickly move is with respect to the exclusion of a lockdown period uh, from timeline for completion of carp under ibc uh, while the notification dated 29 march uh, takes care of any fresh action against companies which might not be able to clear the dues during this unfavorable period the amendment takes care of the companies which are already undergoing resolution process and seeking bidders but what happens to the implementation of the approved resolution plans there comes the legal problem again so uh, there is a difficulty in implementation of the approved resolution plan given the struggling equity market the lockdown would not only affect the already approved resolution plan but also the plans that are already on table for resolution for instance the resolution plan of reliance communication limited wherein bidders would probably want to renegotiate or retract the bid to the detriment of the creditors there is general concern that large cases like ilnfs the divan housing jp infra etc may now take longer to execute resolution plans the ibc also provides for a criminal action against the bidder who would be unable to implement a resolution plan this would negatively affect bidders which defaulted only because of the situation brought about by covid-19 and the lockdown to contain the spread of the same in this backdrop the real issue which warrants the attention of the legislature and the government is the impact of the resultant non implementation of the resolution plan while the recent amendment in the relevant regulations takes care of the time period till the approval of resolution plan no such moratorium or concession has been provided for implementation of the approved resolution plan the legislature must try to come up with some interim exclusion of the time for the bidders if not there would be a floodgate of cases seeking exclusion of such period arguing the impossibility of the implementation of the resolution plan due to the current lockdown and its effect on the equity market and and, and other sectors of the spectrum the business viability of the resolution plan is also necessarily premised upon the valuation of the assets of the company under the resolution it would not be wrong to say that the potential financial stress foreseen by experts across the spectrum would affect the variables of valuation to its detriment going forward the government can also focus on enhancing the infrastructure particularly the e code infrastructure for the nclts and consider exemptions from dispensable process related requirements so that system is not overwhelmed by large number of insolvency resolution cases and in fact help cases of financial distress efficiently with this i conclude my uh, thoughts on this thank you so much vasan for staying uh, within the timeline i appreciate very much uh, krishnawa again 5 to 7 please right. <clears throat> thanks uh, suman most of the issues have been said but i'll try to keep it very brief uh, the last part you touched upon vasan and uh, probably that'll be going to be my first is that uh, but before i start i must uh, wish all the participants the panelists uh, good health and safety for you and all your family uh, i think there are three main issues which i would like to touch upon in the uh, the allotted 5 minutes the first is of course technology which i think was just alluded to alluded to in the last part of it i i think that one thing which sumanth you said that this is going to be a disruptive a disruptive and in all the discussion on technology which is happening nclt and ibc is actually a low hanging fruit because if you look at the discussion of technology which has been happening in the judiciary for the last 15 years okay we have substantially progressed in terms of uh, cause lists online and judgments online and there are two more parts to it one is filing online and arguing online the biggest challenge in the filing still today whilst we allow filing and we see a lot of courts and nclts are doing e filing the truth is it's not filing it's the, most of them put a scan the documents and go and take the pen drive and here we call it e filing the second is you must understand ibc is a summary procedure where the big chunk which is an impediment to uh, technology of evidence trial leading evidence primary evidence secondary evidence all that goes out of the way it is only may, it's a summary procedure summary proceedings 
where it is only on arguments and statements of facts. There is no trial or running an evidence or analysis. So this, like DRT, IBC, certain provisions are low hanging fruit of technology and the government and the IBBI must, must, you know, try to see that if we can push technology hugely in the NCLT case, not only for video conferencing, I am saying also for e-filing. Today, it might be difficult and going forward, this is not a, to my mind, it is not a one month, two month. The social distancing will continue for some time. It will not be prudent for a crowded courtroom to, you know, hear, hear cases. So I would assume that, well, one is the e-filing itself, which is the process of filing on the internet. And the second is the hearings and arguments and the orders. That's the first part. Second part, I think one of the big factor which COVID also, uh, which wasn't but differently touched upon is force major. Now, there are two parts which will come up hugely. One is the resolution applicants who have filed and successful resolution applicant who are supposed to implement the plan. Okay, other than the timeline, the general jurisprudence is force major will not, they won't get a shelter in force major because it's not permanent in nature, it is merely temporary and therefore there is no impossibility or impracticability. Also financial burden is not, is outside the purview of force major clearly. Otherwise everyone who has a financial burden will come and say I can't pay. Then there's no question of bankruptcy, there's no, everyone will be excused to pay because it's financially difficult. So force major and how the NCLTs will interpret it will be an important factor, okay. And because there has been an established jurisprudence, even there are jurisprudence in pandemics, like old jurisprudence with smallpox in uh, the Spanish flu across the world. And the current jurisprudence, I am not sure, will change drastically. So excuse of performance, both as a resolution applicant to implement, may not be excused. And two, uh, corporate debtor definitely will not be excused for payment. And the last part, I mean, I want to say it with all humility, in these trying times, this, these extraordinary times, uh, one particular arm of the IBC, which play a huge part is, of course, the NCLT. Today, there was an extreme, there was an insightful article of Harish Salve in Times of India, I don't know if you read it, where he's talking about some, you know, groups fighting PIL and going to Supreme Court and cautioning the judiciary to say that you must take proper steps. Effectively, the judiciary is a trapeze artist on a very, very thin line. He actually goes to say that, you know, whether it's a PIA, uh, I'll just quote his, you quote John Law and says that governance, when uh, John Law, was, while analyzing the reason of separation of powers, argued that governance is necessarily empirical and experimental. Jurisprudence has to be mathematical and precedent based. So therefore, I am slightly concerned of some of the judgments, not from NCLT, we've seen in recent past where some high courts have stopped, stayed NPAs, which is clearly the domain of RBI. So when, you know, especially in, you know, or stayed enforcement because of certain issues or NPAs when, 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 a, when a company was uh, going into an NPA in the bank's books, the uh, high court has said that. I think these are, there'll be so many of these issues and you pointed out that there will be the human aspect of it in Article 19 and there will be the jurisprudent, precedent, mathematical based aspect of it. And I think that is a place where the NCLTs will have a massive role to play that whether they are going into the executive domain of, uh, you know, experimental or whether they'll go to mathematical and precedent. I think these are my three points. Well, thank you so much, Krishna. And uh, again, uh, very, very crisp and, and to the point. And I and appreciate the uh, the force major point being raised by you because I, I think that's something which probably each one of us that is locked in uh, has logged in, not locked in, uh, has uh, some question uh, on. And they would probably want a, a little bit of expansion on that discussion. So I, I would. Uh, I would touch upon that a little bit. Um, I was thinking that if if I would just sum up in a way of what we have heard from Dr. Vijayvarghe and all of you, uh, you know, honestly, Dr. Vijayvarghe spoke about the steps that have been taken, uh, which, as far as IBBI is concerned, I know is only one on record to say that limitation 
uh, the pause button has been pressed. Uh, I didn't really see anything else from coming from IBBI, but one I did hear as an assurance from Dr. Vijay Bargia that disciplinary proceedings will not be taken up um, against uh, IPs for non-compliances during this period. So a soft approach, which is which is welcome at the moment. Um, and um, she spoke about some of the other things, uh, but she didn't really say anything about the ordinance that is in the in the pipeline at the moment as to what is happening. Obviously, she probably can't speak about that. It's more of an MCA domain. Um, yeah, use of technology. I think it, uh, many of you spoke about the, the technology as something as an outcome that will happen. Uh, I, I, yesterday, Cyril uh, also on Bar and Bench spoke, and you know he, he also emphasized, he also spoke about how the Supreme Court judiciary has so quickly adopted and adopted technology. So surely that is something which is going to happen, and I and I and I really feel that that was uh, something which was waiting to happen whose time had come. For me, I think there are three issues that are bothering most of our uh, listeners at the moment, uh, because each one of them have their own problems in hand, and I'm sure they're more concerned about specifics of that rather than as, as general points that we so, which we have discussed. Of course, those can be distilled into answers, but I'm not taking at the suggestions that are coming on my my WhatsApp, which are being passed on to me by the ASHM team, because suggestions, of course, are fine, but for me, I think some of the questions that people have invariably asked is, what about the valuations? And I think Anil made that point and Sahil made it uh, articulated it also very clearly. I made it also very clear. And I think uh, we should be very, very readily willing to openly reconsider the valuations. Though we can't shut our eyes to reality. Uh, the only guideline and caution that we need to apply is that it should not be abused by anybody. Krishnava mentioned that uh, most of the resolution applicants would like to take shelter of post mature clause, but the jurisprudence that has been developed so far very clearly says that financial inabilities that may have led to, uh, uh, as a result of certain uh, circumstances like the long term, which are beyond your control, we do not entitle you to the benefit of that. Uh, but we will have to see whether. Uh, they would make a case for extension in time, uh, if not not pay at all, but would you be legitimately entitled to? And I also feel that in these are the circumstances where the courts would not view things only from the prism of legality. Equity would also be a very important tool in the toolkit. And in cases of small and medium companies, uh, compassion also would be. So, uh, as I also mentioned in my opening comment, we should be prepared for a relook at the jurisprudence of insolvency. And, and surely the rules of the game would be changed. And I think jurisprudence, even though there are no precedents on the force majeure in this case, but I think the doctrine of impossibility and doctrine of frustration uh, under the Contract Act would also be revisited by the courts. Whether NCLTs can do that or not, whether it is their power to develop that or not, we don't know. NCLAT maybe yes, uh, and therefore we need to depend more on NCLAT to to show throw more lights on that. And and obviously, I think the Supreme Court will settle that issue. Force majeure is something which I think we should do a standalone session. I, that's my suggestion to Asajan is uh, we should do that next week if possible and discuss only a force majeure on that because force majeure needs a but more detailed discussion. You will see invariably people relying on force majeure, not just the resolution applicants, but suppliers and even corporate debtors as an IPs that we'll need in certain case. So we need to discuss that more uh, in, in depth. Uh, one point that I want to discuss, I think, uh, or two points, uh, which are more specific questions that are coming in are that what happens uh, is the uh, ordinance uh, with regard to raising the filing bar from one leg to one crore, does it have a retrospective effect or a prospective effect? Now, my answer to that is it is prospective. It can't be retrospective because it is not explanatory in nature. It is a substantive change. And therefore, all those petitions in which, uh, which had been filed uh, before the ordinance came into being uh, would be maintainable. They cannot be dismissed by the NCLT. Uh, on, and, and the retrospectivity cannot be applied because the Principles are very clear. Retrospective will apply only if it is clarificatory, explanatory in nature, and and that is reflected. But this is a very fundamental change. You can't really call it that way. And although there is a substantive power for the central government to raise whenever they can, the second issue which is being asked to us is that uh, what happens to those cases that had already been filed? 
um, sorry, in those cases where a section eight notice had been issued, uh, but petitions had not been filed. So would the cause action survive just because uh, the section eight notice has been issued? My opinion is, and I'm please, please feel free, the lawyers on the panel, uh, what your opinion might be, but my personal opinion is that no, it is not a notice that gives you the cause of action. It is section nine that gives you the right to file. And therefore, if the section nine is suspended, then even if the section eight notice has been issued, you will not still not be able to file because the filing provision is section nine. It is section eight is only a, a precursor to section nine. So therefore, uh, even section nine, uh, you know, being suspended, if it is suspended, it will be immaterial whether you have issued a section eight before that, uh, and you will not be able to file it. So it is not a limitation pause that would apply to that section eight notice, not at all. The third thing that is being asked is that what if the applications had already been filed? What um, in basis one lakh? So suppose the fifty lakh default basis, an application had been filed but not admitted, is lying in defect. Uh, what happens to that? And my opinion is that those applications will have to be entertained. Uh, they are maintainable in law because they were filed before, as the law as was applicable then. So therefore, clearly, those will, those will have to be adjudicated. Anil made a point that. Uh, the NCLTs will obviously take a very pragmatic view on that as to whether uh, you know one should actually proceed further on this or not. Now that's a matter of, of course, technicality. Uh, they will have to test it on each case, um, uh, and in fact, the banks may, in fact, also will have will also have to sort of take a view on that because there's no point in filing an application if there are no resolution applicants. If there's so much of uncertainty, and and and, uh, and it may just be uh, Section 12A. Maybe now one other observation that I want to make uh, is before I open it to some of the others who may have a, uh, any comment to add on what are the things that I've said in the meantime, and then I look at my phone to see what other questions have come in. Is that uh, section 12a? I think would become uh, a center of attention because uh, a lot of banks would want to wriggle out of the pending IBC cases where the resolution applicants uh, start withdrawing, stepping back, or renegotiating, then they may just mm. actually fall back on the promoters to say, why don't you just and come out with a better deal and, and let's put an end to it. That uh, is a likelihood that we cannot rule out and, and the banks would be more warmed up towards the promoters. And, and, I, and I have a feeling that uh, overall the ecosystem, the support system would also sort of shift in, in that direction. So, um, on, on the comments that I made or anything else that you would want to respond to, uh, I'll in the meantime, please have a look at uh, some of the things uh, that are coming in. Uh, there are some suggestions also coming in, but I, I don't want to get into the suggestions unless it's very, very, please, please go ahead. Any, any of you, if you have a comment. I have just one so, point. <clears throat> on, on so the I would actually like to react. Uh, yeah, I see like there are for third part of the, uh, the topic that we have announced is the, uh, some potential norms and uh, the RBI, uh, uh, it's IRAC uh, norms. So what we have seen so far, the RBI has only excluded this period of lockdown, which may be even extended for the purpose of calculation of any default period. So that is one part of it. So that is very, very simple that whenever we actually calculate the NPA, it will exclude this lockdown period. Now the other part is like, uh, when the lot many businesses in the country, in case you see this RBI circular, which is giving this relaxation, there's a very, very important part is how to finally bail out. Because the most of the uh, participants here today would be expecting that we should talk about some kind of bailout packages for the various businesses and the industry. Every business, every industry would be incurring some losses and also would have to arrange for the funds for meeting that loss. There has to be a bailout package, and I would like to say at this platform, one, that this bailout package actually can be uh, uh, can be made in such a manner that there should be a nodal agency which the central government would set up, and that nodal agency would actually be able to uh, see all the applications which would be forwarded by the banks, and the banks would forward applications based on the actual loss incurred by each business person, each business entity, based on the COVID-19. So in case the nodal agency finally approves that loss and then that particular fund would be uh, given to that business uh, with a very, very subsidized interest rate. And also there can be a possibility of uh, subsidy for the loss. 
so this is one uh, suggestion because first of all but justification of when i say this i say one thing uh, which is very very important to understand that this is a, a, a this is a act of god this is a natural calamity it is not possible to say that all the employers will suffer all the businesses will suffer and the other persons will not suffer in fact each and every part of the society would actually suffer each and every uh, kind of income earner earner would suffer to that extent even the employee would be also suffering depending upon the kind of salary the amount of salary that once they lower the salary so lower the loss higher the salary higher the loss I, I so this noted your point yeah yeah so see, can, the point is I, that the, there, I, there, I, there has to be a yeah. package there has to be yeah. package from the government and that is practically possible that this kind of package may come uh, so that the loss uh, uh, which is incurred by the businesses should actually be it should actually be suffered by each and every part some part of it should be borne by everyone including right. employees including interest earners including landlords and including the fixed income earners everyone right, should I, 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 uh, I have, have some through. kind of loss right anil thank you so much uh, krishna do you have any point uh, yes, uh, to make uh, yeah. or, or... So, so, there are two points yes, one is the, the npa is from 1st march to 31st may not just lockdown it's a three month shifting the npa exception so basically rbi has said that if you have given a moratorium two things has to be satisfied that a if there's a default on 29th of february and two is that if there is if the bank or the lender bank has given a moratorium to uh, the borrower then there will be a npa exemption for that period npa will not be counted i think that's it i just a uh, just a reaction to anil's uh, issue of a bank bad bank concept i think that has been discussed and deliberated at length uh, we don't know where eventually we'll go maybe someone you can probably discuss on that okay uh, sahil would you want to make any point uh, or vasan in fact yeah, i just uh, want to react uh, yeah Sorry. sahil first maybe sahil first vasan yeah. Yeah, just a reaction to you know Anil ji said regarding the uh, uh, you know force major and uh, the way act of God and evolution. So I think insurance uh, uh, will also evolve in a big way. There is a lot of loss of profits for a lot of businesses, and and uh, you know India the insurance market is not very mature. But COVID post COVID things are going to be viewed in a very different manner as regards the various insurance policies are concerned for each of these stakeholders involved in the entire process. So that is one immediate comment to Anil ji. Uh, okay. One on comment, the please, thing, yeah, on the technology thing, uh, there is something positive which uh, maybe uh, many of the panelists and the participants are aware of. Uh, within eight hours, uh, the Archit Pharma deal was, uh, the resolution plan was approved for 1100 crores by almost involving 22 banks. So there is some positive side to it also. We should not uh, forget the fact that it's positive. Uh, with technology, it is possible to implement the resolution plan as well. All right, so there are a couple of uh, suggestions that have come in which I would like to mention. But before that, there's another question, which is that uh, supposing the government were to uh, promulgate the ordinance and suspend the section 7910, but if uh, the similar kind of suspension doesn't take place in respect of the proceedings to be filed against the personal guarantors, then what's the point? Yeah, and I completely agree. And I think that must be the reason why the uh, ordinance has not come in so far, because they would have realized that it would be a meaningful exercise to frustrate the very purpose if you can't file it against the corporate debtor, but you go after the personal guarantor. Because at the end of the day, if you're going as a promoter and the personal guarantor, and he's engaged in in uh, in that uh, uh, proceeding, then obviously the resolution is not going to happen. So I'm sure if the suspension happens, it will happen in respect of the proceedings against the personal guarantors as well as far as the insolvency is concerned. I'm not talking the recovery proceedings. Now the other said the one suggestion that has come in is to make mediation mandatory uh, in respect of the cases. Uh, that's a very fundamental policy shift. I don't think that the government can do this without deliberating and discussing it at length with these uh, industry with the stakeholders. Uh, it is being introduced as a part of the personal insolvency, but as 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 a part of the corporate insolvency, I think we are still a bit distant from from that. Uh, so, uh, but having said that, yes, mediation is already in the back burner for the government and they are already solely brewing as an idea. Uh, one suggestion that has come in is uh, on Section 29A, that in these circumstances, should it not be diluted and be confined only to the willful defaulters? Uh, I, well, If you were to ask me, I, I have always been against 29A, so my answer would be yes, um, as, as a predictable answer, because I think 29A is something 
which the time again for diluting it has come significantly. Uh, and my opinion is that it is going to be diluted in other avatar because if IPC procedures are suspended and the whole thing will shift to uh, out of court restructuring, invariably the promoters are the ones who are going to come in. And similarly, in the prepack also, if prepack is introduced, which is what the government is currently working on, I know that today also there is a meeting where they're discussing corporate uh, cross border insolvency law and prepack both. Want to introduce it as ASAP. Uh, well, prepack again is something which, if uh, uh, will be largely promoter driven, and they will have to dilute it, uh, 29A uh, to make way for prepack. Without that, it won't serve any purpose. So that amendment will have to be introduced in the law as well. So 29A will see further dilution, in my opinion. And and I think on the cross border insolvency, we can still wait for some more time. Dr. Vijay Varga mentioned that the globalization, the whole definition of globalization, the prism through which the globalization takes place is going to change. Uh, but that last point that I want to mention was on, on Anil's point as a reaction on uh, the bad bank. Uh, I, I don't think the government uh, would really uh, consider that. I, I, my sense is, if at all anything can be done at this point in time, is to expedite operationalizing the insolvency and bankruptcy fund for which a provision exists in the law itself but has not been made applicable and the government should put in that money into that in order to allow certain costs to be met uh, so that at least those companies which require some support in the beginning they can borrow money at almost zero percent interest from this fund uh, but this is all repayable and this will be treated as a crp cost so as and when the resolution happens or the liquidation happens, you have to refund this money back to the uh, to the fund as as a priority uh, claim. Uh, but that is what should be, in my opinion, uh, activated so that we have a pool which can you can draw from in order to make certain comments. And any any last minute comment because then we need to sort of wrap it up. No, I just one comment which Anil made on, you know, whether we, I don't know whether the question is the loss should be distributed by all because it's really already there in section 53 waterfall and that's passed over the ages and, you know, centuries. So there are a lot of discussions on that and a lot of debates, but finally, you know, you come back and say the waterfall seems to be the best amongst or the worst amongst all, best amongst, the first amongst the right. So uh, we'll have to wrap it up now See, because no we are already. Yeah. Already at 3:50, Anil. So I'm sorry, we'll have to wrap it up. But it's it's been marvelous uh, that we have close to 600 or even over 600 people logged in, and I really thank all of them for having um, joined and participated and have heard us. And I apologize to those who uh, whose questions we have not been able to answer. It was physically, practically impossible to be able to do that in such a short period of time. Uh, but ASATEM would come out with a small report based on the deliberations that we have held at this session today, uh, which will go in as a recommendations to the government, uh, to IBBA um, and and uh, to the other stakeholders. Uh, obviously confined to IBC, we wouldn't really want to expand the scope beyond that. And we will take up only those issues which are pragmatic. Suggestions are a lot, but we have to be realistic and we shouldn't really be seen to be adventurous. Uh, so about five to six key recommendations will go in. Uh, and. Uh, we uh, there's probably a press release that will also happen. So uh, we will try to uh, capture the essence of today's discussion and the sentiments of which some of the members have expressed uh, in form of suggestions in our recommendations uh, to the government. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, each one of you on the panel and uh, Dr. Vijayvarga and Absentia, and also of course all the listeners for having uh, joined uh, us today and heard us patiently and also uh, seek their apology, seek uh, you know their forgiveness if we have not been able to sort of live up to their standards because in terms of the time that we had allotted that we, we, we actually in the initial time um, um, probably were a bit rep repetitive and, and I hope that uh, uh, we'll make up for it and my last uh, compliments to uh, ASHM team to have done a wonderful job and my request to them is to organize a seminar on force majeure uh, very, very soon. I did one uh, with uh, the IPs very recently. It was very well received because there's a huge amount of interest in that and we should do that and, uh, and largely with a couple of one or two IPs and uh, lawyers uh, so that, you know, we, we can we can deal and maybe a couple of business corporate houses as well because they're the ones who are doing. So uh, that's, I hope Rajesh is listening and, and we will act on that. Thank you.
So thank you so much uh, once again for uh, joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Stay safe, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.